Hi everyone, let's continue to test the claim that the party registration distribution at the college is the same now as it was 10 years ago. That corresponds to the null, which is the claim in this wording. So let's gather sample data. We randomly sampled 300 registered voters now at the college. Now, not 10 years ago. 160 are gray party members, 100 are yellow party members, and 40 are neither. Notice these add up to 300, so uh, there are no other categories. Now, based on the statement of the sample data, we can quickly write out the O table, the table of observed values or frequencies. From the sample data, we construct a table of observed frequencies, the observed O table. We observed 160 gray party members, 100 yellow party members, 40 that were neither. That's the O table. So basically, uh, in a problem that I give you, I would give you the information to immediately fill out the O table. But you now have to figure out the E table, the table of expected values. From the sample size, here n equals 300, and the distribution corresponding to the null, because remember, we're basing calculations under the null. As always with these hypothesis tests, we're basing calculations under the null. Base calculations under the null. We're assuming that these are in fact the proportions today. So then, what would be the expected frequencies for the gray, yellow, and neither party situations. <laughs> uh, well, remember that for a binomial NP distribution, the mean mu was given by N times P, which made sense because, for example, if you flipped a fair coin a hundred times, right, if N was a hundred and if P was one half, then uh, the expected number of heads would be 50, 100 times a half. Now here we have three expected frequencies. For the gray party, it's NPG, 300 times 0 0.50, which is 150. For ye the yellow party, it's NPY, which is 300 times 0 0.40 or, one or 120. For neither, it is NP sub N, which is 300 times 0 0.10 or 30. Because remember, the null hypothesis says that today we have 50% gray, 40% yellow, 10% neither. So if those proportions are reflected perfectly in our sample, then we would get exactly these values. This is sort of the ideal for the null. So if we in fact were to get these frequencies in our sample, then that would perfectly reflect the null. However, we do get some sampling error. The question is, well, can we chalk these discrepancies up to sampling error or are the differences between the two tables so extreme that we go, you know what, this ain't sampling error, something else is going on. We gotta reject the null. <laughs> okay, uh, as in lesson 34, uh, we have to make sure that these values are at least five. Uh, bear in mind, I'm not going to trick you like that on homework or tests. And as a check, you can make sure that these add up to N, which is 300. Uh, or uh, another way to use this fact, when you calculate the 150 and the 120, you can subtract these from N or 300 to get the 30. All right. But in any case, at this point, we have an O table and an E table. Now, the chi-square test statistic is going to measure the discrepancy between these two tables. The chi-square test statistic we're going to use is a single measure that will describe how these two tables are different. The test statistic. Again, we use a chi-square test statistic to describe how different the O table, based on our sample, is from the E table, which is based on the null. So again, the O table, I'll, I'll put this in blue. The O table is based on the sample data. And I give you that information as part of the problem. The E table is based on calculations based on the null hypothesis and you can figure those out. Now, the larger this chi-square value is, 
the greater the discrepancy, the more likely it is we will reject the null. And that's why the tests of this lesson and the next one, in fact, are right-tailed. So again, the null hypothesis, in fact, corresponds to a situation where the test chi-square is zero. The alternative is more favored. Remember, chi-square values are never negative. Uh, the alternative is more favored if you have a higher value for chi-square, which corresponds to a greater distinction between these two tables. So here's the deal. And in fact, I have Excel to help out here. All right, so here's a, an Excel spreadsheet I made up. Okay, so here I've entered in the O values, the observed frequencies, 160 gray party members in our actual sample, 100 yellow party members, whoops, 100 yellow party members, and 40 were neither in our actual sample of 300 actual live voters. I hope they're live, otherwise we're talking Chicago marine, machine politics, but uh, <laughs> uh, okay, that's today. Now, the expected frequencies are values based on the null, right? 150, 120, 30. Now, the chi-square test statistic is going to be a measurement of how different these two tables are, the red table versus the blue table. I'll go through these calculations later on, but it turns out this test chi-square value based on our sample, well, based on both the O table and the E table, will be about 7.3. Now check this out. What if the observed frequencies had matched the expected frequencies? What if we, ob we, what if we had observed 150 gray voters, 120 yellow voters, and 30 neither? Then look at this. The test chi-square value would have been zero, indicating that the sample would have perf perfectly reflected the null hypothesis. Uh, what if we had something really extreme? Uh, what if uh, we went into anarchy? 300 neithers. <laughs> no gray, no yellow. Oh, wow, that, look at that test chi-square. 2,700. I'm sure we're going to reject the null in that case. Okay. <laughs> Over here, we're not so sure. What was it? It was, uh, what was it? It was 160, 140. All right. Now, is this test chi-square value so big that we reject the null? Or is it close enough to zero that the null is still safe? All right. Well, uh, we have two degrees of freedom because the formula, again, right tail because we reject the null in favor of the alternative for a right tail test. Remember, we reject this in favor of this, the notion that the distribution is different now. We reject this in favor of this if the chi square test square, if the test chi square is high. All right, how many degrees of freedom? It's not n minus one, it's not 299. It's k minus one, where k is the number of categories. There were three categories, gray party, yellow party, and neither. So therefore, uh, it's going to be three minus one or two degrees of freedom, not 299. <laughs> All right, find the corresponding p-value. It's a right tail test, so we need a right tail p-value. Uh, but by the way, the density curve for a chi-square on one or two degrees of freedom, it's a slide, uh, not something like this, but don't worry about that. Um, and what is the right-tailed p-value? It turns out to be 0 0.0256. The right-tailed p-value turns out to be 0 0.0256, and my Excel spreadsheet confirms that. That's the right-tailed p-value for this chi-square uh, test value under two degrees of freedom with an alpha value of 5%. That affects... Uh, how much probability? Uh, oh, no, 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 I'm sorry. Uh, alpha doesn't matter just yet. Alpha doesn't matter just yet. Okay. Later on, we'll compare to alpha. Now here, uh, by the way, the Excel uh, command, since it's a right tail probability, all right, then it's a one minus deal. It's one minus the cumulative probability to the left up to this value. Uh, D8 is the value, the chi-square value, 7.3 bar. Uh, D9 is the number of degrees of freedom. I put true because we want a cumulative probability, not the y-coordinate up here. I don't know why you'd want that. <laughs> Maybe the graph. Okay. Ah, all right. Now, now, here's where alpha comes in. Okay, the 0.05. This is where alpha comes in. 
is the p-value low? Well, is it lower than alpha? All right, here's our p-value, the 0 0.0256. Here's alpha, 0 0.05. So about 2.6% versus 5% is the p-value low, lower than alpha? Yes, it is. The p-value is lower than alpha. The p-value is low. Therefore, the null must go away. The null must go away. We reject the null. We reject the null. Same old, same old. Is it strong or weak? Is that a strong result or a weak result? That's strong, statistically significant. We can publish it. <laughs> Finally, we write a conclusion relative to the, play, the claim. We reject the null, so, we, so that's a strong result. There is sufficient evidence to say what? Well, the claim was, in this problem, the null, based on the wording. Okay, the null is the claim based on the wording. All right, the null is on trial, all right, so we're weighing evidence against that null claim. Put it all together. I'll use, uh, there is sufficient evidence against the claim that the party registration distribution at the college is the same as it was 10 years ago. So let's say, we, we take a look at these two tables here, right? Okay, so this, these are the values that are based on the proportions from 10 years ago, right? These are the values that we saw in our sample from today. Now, let's say the, the yellow party, all right? Let's say the, the, uh, the leader of the, the, uh, the, the uh, yellow party members of the student body, all right? The yellow party members of the student body. Let's say they're saying, you know what? We think that the distribution is still really the same as it was 10 years ago. I know it looks like there's been some slippage from the 120 to 100, but we, the yellow party, we believe that at this college that the distribution is still the same as it was 10 years ago. You can chalk this up to sampling error. Ah, well, based on that p-value relative to that value of alpha, we're saying, if the, hey, if that's your claim, yellow party, if that's your claim, then uh-uh, uh, no. There is sufficient evidence against that claim, okay? So you look at these two tables, there's a difference. Now, technically, the test does not formally say in which ways the differences are, but the sample suggests it, right? Okay, basically, the statistical test allows us to conclude that the distribution now is different from it was 10 years ago, okay? We can infer that the yellow party is doing worse. All right. Bear in mind that if alpha were 1%, we would not be prepared to say that. And the yellow party will give it a pass. Uh, we'll say, well, yeah, your claim might be okay. But uh, no, the p-value is less than this alpha. We're going to tell the yellow party, sorry, folks, the distribution is different from, it was, from what it was 10 years ago. And it looks like you're losing uh, or you're losing support compared to 10 years ago. Uh, they've always been losing. <laughs> it looks like they've always been losing. All right. Now, just a side note, where do we get the 7.333, okay? Uh, now, you don't have to worry about this. I used to, but you don't have to worry about this. Uh, here's the formula for the, uh, the chi-square test statistic for goodness of fit, and it'll look similar to what we see, what we see in a later lesson, all right? It kind of has the flavor of variance, where you have this idea of a squared deviation. There's a rescaling, and you're adding. So it kind of has the flavor of a variance. Okay, and here are the calculations. Uh, it's the square of the deviation. So for each row, all right, it's the square of the deviation, and you divide by the E value as a rescaling. Right? So you get this from the gray party, this fraction from the yellow party, this fraction from neither. You get a 7.333. Uh, here I'm adding the three contributions. Bear in mind, if we had gotten in our sample, 150, 120, and 30, the test chi score would have been zero, right? Because all these differences would have been zero. Okay. Again, if we had had 
a match between the sample and the expected frequencies, our chi-score would have been zero. No evidence against the null, none whatsoever. So the yellow party would totally be uh, cool in saying that, hey, the distribution is the same as it was 10 years ago. Kind of like uh, if, you, if the null uh, posits a fair coin and we get 50 heads on 100 flips. Footnotes. What's the idea of a left tail test? And Gregor Mendel has been accused of this, the father of genetics. What if the sample data fits the expected frequencies too perfectly? Your test chi-square is just too good to be true. That could, then a left tail test could be a way to test for fraud. We may be concerned that the observed values may be too close to the expected values. Did Gregor Mendel manipulate his genetics data by discarding data that, that seemed unfavorable to his claim? Uh, although Mendel may have thought that he had done nothing wrong. Oh, I, I, just, I just don't like this P. It looks funny, I'll toss it out. He may have not realized that he was conducting statistical malpractice when he was doing that. One calculation of one of his study, studies showed a left LP value of one in 25,000, meaning that the probability of getting something as perfect as what Mendel got by chance relative to the null was that. His, re his results were just too perfect. <laughs> okay, next up, chi-square tests for independence which have similarities and differences. Next time.